work for a government agency. Always looking for good, enthusiastic men to help us carry out our directives. You're telling me that there is a movie company in Hollywood right now that is funded by the CIA? I think probably Hollywood is full of CIA agents, and we just don't know it. I mean, can you ever really trust another human being? No, the answer is you cannot. Either very smart or incredibly stupid. Test, test, everything's a test, remember? Nothing is what it seems. Hello everyone, and welcome to the CIA and Hollywood. I am Tom Secker of SpyCulture.com. And I'm Pierce Redmond of PorkinsPolicyReview.com, and this is episode one, The CIA and George Orwell. with a difference. The first full-length cartoon film to be made in England. Produced by the brilliant team of Hallis and Bachelor, it has been acclaimed by New York and London critics alike. It tells a compelling story for every adult. Yet it's assuredly a film that every child can enjoy. Come and visit Animal Farm, where all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Meet its quite extraordinary inhabitants, the wise and wishful old Major. But remember, now and forever, all animals are equal. Napoleon, a pig of a dictator. Squealer of the sly eye and lying tongue. Long live Napoleon! And Snowball, who is hounded out of his animal kingdom. You'll love Boxer, who works like a horse. His faithful friends, Benjamin the Willing Donkey. Muriel, who acts the goat. Then, of course, there's the drunken farmer, Jones, who gets his just desserts. And Wimper, who wangles and barters till it hurts. Remember then to visit Animal Farm. Make certain you watch Pig Brother just as he is watching you. Okay, so in today's show, we're going to be looking at two 1950s film adaptations of George Orwell's novels Animal Farm and 1984, and both of these films were produced with the help of the CIA. But before we get into all that, this is a new series, so I think it's probably best if we use this opportunity to kind of briefly outline our aims for this series, and at least what people can expect from it. And for me, B.S., I mean, there's, there's two core concepts that I want us to explore in this first season one of which applies to this episode and one of which, to be honest, doesn't really. Um, <laughs> I mean, the concept that doesn't really apply is that these days the CIA has its own entertainment liaison office, right, that works with film and TV producers quite openly and quite explicitly. And for the first decade or so of its existence, from about 1996 to 2007, it was run by a guy called Chase Brandon. And we're going to be exploring his influence on films in quite a lot of depth in later episodes of this season. Though obviously he wasn't involved in the two 1950s movies that we're going to be exploring today. But the other concept is that unlike with a lot of conventional analysis of these kinds of um, these phenomena, let's say, when people look at like the FBI in Hollywood, it's clear that a lot of their work is just focused on their public image and on their PR, and they're trying yes. to boost their public image. But with the CIA's involvement in Hollywood, it's much more complex and much more subversive and a lot more interesting, I would actually say, than that. And this is something that obviously applies very much to both Animal Farm and 1984, because the CIA is not mentioned in the, either of these films, of course. It does not appear in either film. It's got nothing to do with the CIA on the face of it. So that's my take, basically, on where we're going with this series. Um, and, yes, I mean, do you have anything to add to that about what people can expect from, from what we're doing here? 
Yeah, I think uh, I think people can expect a, a very, as you said, a very different approach to this sort of analysis. And you know, many times when people mention the connections between uh, the CIA and Hollywood, it's always in the sort of vein of, oh, they're just trying to make the CIA look good. And certainly there are many productions going on in Hollywood that essentially follow that sort of tact where it's just about making the CIA look awesome and powerful and sure, sure. You know, great. But many of the films that we picked in this series um, don't necessarily portray them in a positive light or portray them in a much more complex sort of light. And that's what's so interesting about the CIA, as opposed to, say, the FBI or the DOD when they get involved in movies. And um, <clears throat> I think that's what's so fascinating about the CIA is that they, they're willing to sort of sh cast a semi-negative light on what they do. Uh, and more broadly speaking, I think as we're going to see uh, with the movie Animal Farm today, that the CIA is much more deeply involved in culture creation, that they're not just concerned with portraying the CIA in a particular light, they're much more concerned with pushing uh, certain social mores, certain ideas um, in a way that you know, you don't see uh, with the FBI or the DOD or, or any of these other organizations that, that do get involved in, in Hollywood. So, yeah, and uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm so excited to finally be recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we have been looking forward to this one for quite some time. So, uh well, I mean, let's let's crack on with it. Let's take these films mm. in chronological order because it makes sense to do that. And that is, of course, also the order in which the books were written. Um, mm -hmm. So we're looking at Animal Farm first. I mean, the CIA connection to this film first emerged in the 1970s, I think, in the first autobiography of E. Howard Hunt, this longtime CIA employee who was also one of the Watergate burglars. And he's a man who made a dare I say it, probably misleading deathbed confession about his involvement in the Kennedy assassination, the JFK assassination, not the Bobby Kennedy. Um, but we don't have to just rely on Howard Hunt for this information, fortunately, since <laughs> I don't consider him a very trustworthy man in any sense of the word. Um, but the, the CIA involvement in this film is not in any dispute. I mean, even the, the commentary and the making of documentary that's on the uh, they released a 60th anniversary DVD of this film uh, at the end of last year that I actually got. Um, and they, they talk about this quite openly. So this isn't in any way, I think it's fair to say, it's, it's not in dispute. But the story goes, Howard Hunt approached George Orwell's wife shortly after the author's death, shortly after he died, and persuaded her to sell the film rights to these books to the CIA. Whether she knew that it was the CIA who'd come calling, I don't think so. But anyway, they then recruit the Hollywood producer Louis de Rochemont, who puts the Animal Farm film project together. He hires this British animation company, Hallison Bachelor. They actually make the finished film. And it was actually uh, the first feature-length, like, full-color animation film ever made here in the UK. So it is not just culture creation from a kind of philosophical and, uh, mm. you know, that kind of point of view. It is, I suppose, to a certain extent, a big boost to the British animation industry that this film got made so it's you know cultural creation in, and it's historically important in that sense as well but before we get into the background of this animation company and the background of mr louis de rochemont um <laughs> i really liked this film i have to mm. admit i really enjoyed watching this i thought you know the music the voices the actual quality of the animation it's it's superb it's a really really good bit of cinema i thought mm. um but pierce how about you yeah, I actually was. Uh, I was. I was pretty surprised by it. Uh, I am a, a huge, huge fan of uh, animation and cartoons in general. Um, I say, you know, most of my my favorite TV shows are, are animated. So, uh, I, you know, I, I consider myself having a pretty good eye for animation. And this is uh, excellent. It is a gorgeous looking film. It is um, taken in the context of all of this sort of Disney crap that was going on. This yeah. is a, a very dark film. The the color palette is very interesting. There's this grimy sort of dirty nature uh to many of the characters and to the overall look so from a just a visual standpoint it is a gorgeous looking movie um and then you know beyond that uh there are obvious changes that were made and we'll, we'll get into that later but um even some of the the sort of changes are interesting and uh the way the movie is set up is quite good and it is actually pretty enjoyable up until the very end um, so yeah, I was actually surprised, and and again, this sort of proves the the idea that um, 
the, the CIA can make a good film if they really want to. <laughs> um, and then, of course, there's always that sort of added element where you, they, they sort of uh, they push their own narrative. But, yeah, I was actually quite surprised. And I think people will enjoy uh, watching the movie. And, and I hope that they watch it before they listen to everything. Well, yeah, that we have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I would recommend people probably if they haven't seen the film or at least haven't seen it recently, they stop this now and go and watch the film. It is widely, widely available. It's on YouTube. Mm. It's available on download for all sorts of places. It's not a difficult film to find. Um, and you did you just raised something quite interesting that I mean, I think most of these films that we've already looked at ourselves, I mean, not in this mm. se- series yet, but most of the films we're going to be looking at in this series, I think are quite good films on the whole. They yeah. certainly, I say, the standard of them is better than the average DOD-assisted movie, because a lot of those are terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, they really are. So, it's... Yeah, and this one does stand out. It does stand out as a piece of 1950s animation that is of a higher quality than I think a lot of pretty much anything else, actually, probably, mm-hmm. out, out there around that time. But I do think we should get into the, some of the backstory of this film, because that's the... That's where this story really gets interesting for me, because both Louis de Rochemont and Hallis and Bachelor are pretty interesting. They've got some, some pretty interesting connections going on. Louis, Louis de Rochemont, he made his name making those uh, March of Time newsreels in the 30s and 40s. And he actually made a, um, a feature length episode called We Are the Marines, which was, of course, made with the Marine Corps. Um, he also worked with the U.S. Navy's film unit during World War Two. And he made the film House on 92nd Street, which is a wartime spy thriller, a anti-Nazi wartime spy thriller made with the absolute full cooperation of the FBI. Then it starts to get a bit curious because after the war, he produced uh, the film 13 Rue Madeleine, which is one of a trio of movies promoting and glorifying the work of the OSS. And I know we've talked about these films before, P.S. a bit. Mm. At some point, we will be covering them, hopefully on this series. Um, But... I mean, this film, initially, it got the cooperation of Bill Donovan, right, the head of the OSS, or at that point, former head of the OSS. But there was some kind of falling out halfway through the filming, and Donovan actually withdrew his support, and this screwed things up a bit. But anyway, I mean, Rochemont wasn't kind of put off by this. He went on to make another film with the FBI in 1951, which is called A Day with the FBI, starring J. Edgar Hoover. Um... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and then, of course, he makes Animal Farm in 1954 with the help of the CIA. And he was actually trying to make, for years after he made Animal Farm, right, he was trying to make um, a kind of CIA docudrama of some sort, you know, a very sort of hard, cold look at the CIA. But they always refused, even though he had this, you know, great long experience with five, yeah, five different government agencies, including themselves, including the CIA. They didn't want him making a film that was directly about them at that time. And I think that's just because... They were just very secretive at that point. They basically mm-hmm. tried tried to have no public image in the 1950s. They just didn't really want people referring to them, if at all possible. So it's probably more to do with that than, I would say, anything else. But, uh, I mean, P.S., what do you make of Louis de Rochemont? And what do you, also, what do you make of, of, of Hallison Bachelor? Well, Louis de Rochemont is a really fascinating character. And, and again, I think he's, it's, he's a great person to start looking, you know, you can use him as a sort of template for a lot of the other people that we're going to be exploring later on because he seems to, again, uh, move in between entertainment, government, uh, the, you know, news. He, you know, made a lot of news documentaries as well. Um, so he's a really fascinating character and I think is a, a really excellent, like I said, template for the type of person that gets involved um, w- within this sort of work. Um, and, you know, equally interesting, as you said, are, uh, are Hallis and Bachelor, um, <clears throat> who, you know, at first when I when I was sort of researching and looking into them, uh, they seemed very sort of uh, surprised uh, that these allegations that the CIA was was funding the movie, and uh, they they claimed that they had no idea, and perhaps they didn't. But uh, you know, even a, a cursory glance at the sort of work that they did, it's no surprise that the CIA went to them and asked them to create an entire animated film about Orwell's work. So, um, you know, just as a little, little, you know, background on them, John Hallis is, is Hungarian and he met Joy Bachelor in London in 1937 and he was looking for animators and apparently he hired her right on the spot. Uh, and they went back to Budapest 
and they worked on a, uh, an animated film there, but left just before World War II. And they returned and they formed their own animation company, Hallis and Bachelor. And they started making commercials for things like Kellogg's and some other big name brands. And then with World War II, propaganda films were in demand, obviously. And the two of them began making animated films for the Ministry of Information. And um, some of the big ones are like uh, Dustbin Parade, which was one that I think you can even find that one on YouTube. Um, but they made other ones, and a really interesting series that they made uh, during World War II for propaganda purposes was a cartoon called Abu, uh, or the Abu series, and it was made in Arabic about a young boy and a donkey that fight fascism all over the Middle East. Um, so very interesting. Uh, and that one obviously was not meant for domestic consumption. Uh uh, so, you know, that, that's a really fascinating one. After the war, they made a uh, series called the Charlie series, which is all about the social security reform that was going on. They also made two films for the Marshall Plan. One's called The Shoemaker and the Hatter, and a portion of that is available on YouTube. And another one called Think of the Future, um, which is also about the Marshall Plan. And it's actually during the time that they were making the, the movies for the Marshall Plan that they actually started uh, making Animal Farm because it took about three years to complete. They started in 1951 and it ended about 1954. But basically, to kind of sum that up, this is you're looking at an animation company that was very in tune with government work. They knew how to make it, uh, and they knew how to make it really, you know, quite well. Uh, so, <laughs> did they have no idea who Louis de Rochemont was? Uh, you know, working for, I kind of doubt it. I think that you don't get involved in that world um, and, and you know, c continually make movies. Because it wasn't, as I said, you know, it's not just the World War II propaganda. Then they made propaganda for the British government itself. Then they made propaganda for the Marshall Plan. Um, so they certainly, I think, had a, a, a an idea about what was going on. Um, but not to paint them totally as a, some sort of puppet, they also made um, quite a few uh, experimental Films. They made the first uh, 3D animated film ever, The Owl and the Pussycat. Um, and um, anyone uh, who, like myself, is a fan of craft work will recognize the uh, Autobahn uh, music video from the 70s is animated, and that's actually Hallis and Bachelor that made that. So really, they did make a yes, yeah, yeah, the animated awesome. uh, Autobahn. Yeah, that is uh, that is <laughs> Hallis and Bachelor. So they did make a quite you know they. And I think again, that is why they were chosen as well is because it wasn't. It's one thing to make propaganda films. Anyone can make a propaganda film, uh, especially, you know, a propaganda cartoon. It's not that difficult. But to make ones uh, that are truly different, to make things that become, as we're talking about, part of culture, uh, that's really difficult. Um, and to make something that is, uh, on the one hand, a, you know, a tool to push a certain political ideology – while at the same time is a piece of art, that's really difficult. And I think that's really what Hallis and Bachelor um, were really about. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> no, sure. That's a, uh, You certainly told me quite a lot there that I did not know about them. And they're from this country. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you're absolutely right. And one of the things that you, you said about that cartoon series uh, about uh, Abu and the donkey that mm. was clearly aimed at, I, I assume, was in some way being shipped out or dropped into Middle Eastern countries to try and inspire mm. the fight against at least Nazi Germany um, there, is that this is one of the reasons why the CIA um, picked an animation company or, or one of the reasons why they picked Animal Farm as a story was that they envisaged using it uh, in animated form, because it's a story mm -hmm. you can tell more easily through animation than you could, obviously, by having a bunch of anim real animals yeah. <laughs> running around and trying to film them. Though that would be ace. That would be mm. a very interesting film. Um, because they thought this means that more people will get it. It will have more of a, a just a broader appeal that people won't have to be able to speak the language necessarily in order to be able to follow the story because it's all animated. You're watching it all happen on the screen. So mm. um this is one of the reasons why they went down this kind of road with this production. And so therefore it's no surprise that you get someone like Hallison and Batchelor who were very, very good animators. Let's mm -hmm. face it. They're very talented, you know, people, very, very high standards. So I can see why they, why they did it. I mean, my take on this is that I don't know whether Hallison and Batchelor were kept in the dark or not, but it seems they were reaching out for this kind of work. It seems like they were actively pursuing this kind of work, not just in World War II, and at, but also afterwards from what you were just saying. So it strikes me they 
even if they didn't know exactly who this American producer was who mm-hmm. wanted them to make this version of Animal Farm, they could probably guess, you know, there's some kind of government involvement here. And Louis de Rochemont himself, he must have known. He must have known who his employers were and who was really paying for all this. That's my oh, yeah. opinion anyway. I assume I assume you agree. Oh, yeah, uh, without a doubt. I, I think, again, he, he was <laughs> he's too smart not to know. And I think that's the other thing. I think John Hallis and Joy Batchelor uh, were too smart not to have some idea that this, uh, you know, <laughs> American producer who comes out. And again, Hallis and Batchelor's animation company was tiny. And they got such an influx of money to make this film that, I mean, they like tripled the size of their staff. They hired way more. They, they built themselves up into the animation company in uh, the United Kingdom at the time. So, again, you know, who's providing all of this money? You're talking about a film that took three years to complete. This is a huge endeavor. And to think that this is all, oh, we just want to make this, this cute film about, <laughs> you know, Animal Farm. That, that can't really be the case. And again, as we see, the, the alterations in this movie are very deliberate. And I, I, I have to imagine that uh, John Hallis and Joy Batchelor understood uh, at least something about who was funding this movie or who was supporting this movie based on the kind of changes that went on. And just briefly, um, there is actually a, a live action version of Animal Farm um, with uh, talking animals that was made by the, the Hallmark company. Really? Um, yeah, and it's I I did check it out, and it's pretty awful. It's 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 just filled with celebrity voices, and they made it, uh, and they completely I would say it has almost nothing to do with the book. Everything is changed, um, and it's basically uh, it just the Animal Farm sort of collapses on its own, and they made this movie just as the you know the Berlin Wall was coming down. So that's the sort of I think idea behind it that communism will just eventually collapse upon itself, and that and it was panned. Um, by every, even the you know I think the the uh, the most you know violent anti communist said it was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, something something else I didn't know. <laughs> you're, you're, mm. you're bringing some very interesting stuff into this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Unexpected, but it's great. Yeah. Um, anyway, I wanted to get into the the paper trail a bit because there is some good stuff in the paper trail on this mm. on this film, and of course all of these documents that I'm going to talk about and we're going to talk about are going to be posted on spyculture.com so if anyone wants to actually look at them themselves they can um i mean first i have asked the cia i have filed a FOIA request with the cia for documents on the making of this film but they deny having any um they say they don't they don't have any records on it and they did also say in their reply that other people have made the same request so i can assume if there is anything in that they've got then they're not releasing it um but i did find a few references in the CIA's uh, online document database to operations involving the use of George Orwell's books in this same, you know, early Cold War period. So I thought, I thought we'd take a look at those just because just to establish that this, Mm. you know, this is what they were involved in doing. So therefore, there's no doubt, again, that they were involved in Animal Farm. Uh, The first one is from the CIA director's log dated in September 1951. It talks about a CIA subsidized newspaper in Vienna and that they'd managed to boost the circulation of this newspaper, partly because they'd sent out a special edition that included a copy of Animal Farm. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> there you go. But also, there was there was three documents from this anti-Soviet, I don't know, psychological warfare subversion operation. It's a series of operations that took place under the code name Aerodynamic, um, and three of these documents mention Orwell's work. There's uh, one where they talk about <clears throat> Sorry, one where they talk about pamphlets that they were handing out at the Vienna Youth Festival that had quotations from Orwell in. Uh, there was another one that mentioned that they left copies of 1984, uh, among other books, including Dr. Zhivago, of course, <laughs> uh, that they left them in a hotel lobby in New York when the Bolshoi Ballet were in town in the hope that they would, you know, pick up these books on their way out kind of thing. Um, and there was also an interview with a young female student who had somehow escaped from the Soviet Union, and she mentioned having read prescribed books, and one of the books that she mentioned was Animal Farm. So even in the absence of documents from the actual you know, CIA Animal Farm film production, I think that this handful of papers do prove that the CIA were using Orwell's work at this time for these exact sorts of purposes. At the very least, we can be dead certain of that. Is there anything you'd add you'd add to that or is i mean do you have any kind of residual doubt of the cia involvement in this film or not 
Oh no, no, I, I, not at all. And there's actually been quite a bit of, uh, you know, fairly, you know, scholarly work on on animal farm, at least in particular. Uh, I don't, I really don't think there's much doubt beyond, uh, you know, what we've just been saying that they, they were certainly involved. And I think, you know, broadly speaking, uh, I the CIA was a, on some level obsessed with Orwell, <laughs> um, you know, to the point <laughs> yeah. that they that they would run. Uh, an operation where they would just leave books of his in the hopes that, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, in one of those uh, documents on aerodynamic, I mean, they're talking about leaving books in the hotel lobby because some Soviet attache was staying there. So they're hoping, I guess, that he reads 1984 and realizes that, uh, oh, you know, the Soviet Union uh, must be taken down. And he, you know what I mean? It's It's so kind of crazy. And I think on a on a bigger level, it does make sense that they would uh, want to use the power of Orwell because his books are so powerful. And I think there's also a sort of um, sick kind of uh, manipulation going on there that, that the CIA perceived that by, you know, corrupting his practices or his books and using them for their own means would, you know, only inflate their own power. Um, so that's sort of a more, I don't know, kind of occult sort of uh, look into the CIA and and the use of Orwell, um, which might sound kind of nutty, but as we're going to see in some of our other films, the CIA is quite into uh, the sort of occult magic practices. And again, I think the idea of, of taking something like Animal Farm and then slightly changing it and then sort of using that to their own sort of, you know, ends is, uh, is something that the CIA would be involved in. Um, and of course I think the CIA is a, an organization that's very adaptable and understands that they understand popular culture quite well. And there's no doubt that animal farm in 1984 were extremely popular and they understood that they could use that. And, uh, and again, we're talking about in the in the fifties when all this was going on. This is around the the same time that the CIA was uh, f- putting quite a bit of money into the abstract expressionist movement. Mm-hmm. So Jackson Pollock, uh, De Kooning, Mark Rothko, many of these people were parts of various left wing socialist organizations that were funded exclusively by the CIA. So again, we're talking, which is not to say that abstract expressionism and, and modern art was created by them. But it was certainly, you know, massaged. It was certainly helped along in a, in a way. So, yeah, to, to think that they wouldn't be involved in, in George Orwell's uh, stuff is, is, I think, naive at best. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, well, and of course, you've got to look at the way that they behaved. They waited until Orwell died and then mm-hmm. moved very quickly. And as soon as they had the rights to this stuff, they started using it in all sorts of different ways. Mm. So they clearly knew that Orwell wouldn't have said yes to them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's fair to say. But, you know, they chucked money at a woman whose husband's just died and mm-hmm. she she signed something. I mean, it's understandable, of course. Um the other document that I really wanted to get into is George Orwell's FBI file, because, I mean, the whole thing is interesting. Um, and it all uh, refers to stuff after Orwell died. They never actually had an investigation into Orwell himself. The FBI didn't, though he was the subject of investigations by the British Special Branch and by MI5. And obviously, I'll include all of these documents, like I say. But, I mean, the really interesting thing is that Orwell's FBI file shows that Louis de Rochemont who hadn't been in touch with the FBI for at least a couple of years by that point, writes to them to tell them ahead of time that he's producing this film of Animal Farm. And then after the film is released, he writes to them again and sends them this whole bunch of positive reviews and news clippings um, to sort of tell them about, you know, the success and the positive response to this. And there is a really funny memo from um, the assistant to J. Edgar Hoover, and it's sent to the associate director, Clyde Tolson, and it says, it appears that Louis de Rochemont has hit the <laughs> jackpot again. And I just, mm, I just mm. thought this is, you know, it, it seems like the FBI weren't in on the joke, that they didn't realize <laughs> that this was a CIA project. So I'm wondering, why is it that Louis de Rochemont even wrote to them? Was he just sort of gloating or, or was this some kind of, I don't know, a sort of sick joke on the CIA's part? Because like you say, they've clearly got... Um, a rather unpleasant approach to all of this, that they see this really powerful anti-statist, anti-authoritarian work of fiction, or two works of fiction by Orwell, and their thought is, let's vandalise and corrupt and co-opt these for our own purposes. And so I'm wondering, 
I mean, I don't know, Pierce. What do you make of this? What do you make of why did why was Louis de Rosa yeah. writing to the FBI? What's this about? <laughs> that document is is quite interesting, and and um, I you know I can only assume that this was that this was sort of a, a like a. A, a fuck you to the FBI sure. from the CIA, and and we're talking again about a, a, a time when there was, a, you know, they were constantly fighting back and forth with one another, mm-hmm. and um and Hoover was you know obsessed and paranoid that the CIA was infiltrating the FBI. Uh, every time Hoover turned around, he had another agent that the FBI, uh, that the CIA was scooping up or asking to do you know oh do a job for me here you know and. Uh, and and hey, if you hear anything of you know what's going on in at uh, you know in in uh, you know Hoover's circle, let me know about it. So I I could only assume that yeah, perhaps uh, De Rochemont was just sort of um, you know kind of uh, giving them the finger and just sort of telling them that uh, you know hey, <laughs> look what I'm doing now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's you know, and again, I can only I think, assume yeah. that yeah. Yeah, and I and uh, yeah, I think we just have to again look at the context of when you know in the fifties when this was going on, there was certainly we're talking about the CIA basically in its infancy, and it wants to assert its power and did very fast, and not just with the FBI, but with um, other groups like the the FBN, the precursor to the DEA. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there are many many groups that the the CIA wanted to control or at least sort of turn into an auxiliary force for them. And uh, yeah, I think I think that that might be it because again, why was Durashman even uh, sending this letter? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it almost does seem like a sort of gloating uh, thing. And and in the um, in that the that sort of cash on uh, uh, George Orwell's FBI file, I mean, there are other uh, memos in there where they're uh, they're they're you know talking about what you know what Orwell is saying, and and of course the FBI is the, the more sort of reactionary group um, that would be kind of pissed. Uh, you know, and, and would be trying to kind of get rid of all of these books or to censor them, whereas the CIA um, is the is the more sort of open uh, organ. And that, that sounds very odd, um, right? And they would be more sort of well, no, 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 like don't don't censor it. We just have to use it. We have to subvert what Orwell is saying. So I, I think that might be a bit of what uh, Darashman is saying in that. Um, and I think again. Um, the CIA at that point was seen as the much more glamorous of the two organizations, um, the one that's a bit, as I said, more open. And I think he was just sort of, you know, saying, well, screw you, you know, I'm I'm going to do this now. Uh, and look what I did. I made the, you know, the most popular animated film of, uh, of I don't know, probably of that decade, I would think. I mean, this, is, this movie was wildly successful. It made them a ton of money. Um, so I think he was also quite proud of it. And in that uh, FBI file, I mean, uh, much of it is uh, is news clippings <laughs> about how how wonderful this movie was, and uh, it was received very well in the press. And again, I mean, you know, <laughs> who knows how many of these journalists were were on the CIA payroll? But uh, all the same, I mean, it was it was extremely successful. Well, for sure, for sure. And I'm now thinking, now that you you raised that possibility. I'm thinking, was was Louis de Rochemont put up to this by the CIA? Mm. I mean, not just in the sense of making the film, but was he put up to writing to the FBI as a sort of, like you say, sticking up two fingers at them or something? Because <laughs> um, he, he was, like I say, at this point, he was really trying to, he wanted to make a film about the CIA. He wanted mm-hmm. to get in with them. They were very much the agency he want, he was interested in and wanted to make films yeah. about. So he probably would have done pretty much anything they suggested at that point. <laughs> so if they say, well, you know, right, you know, you were making those FBI films a couple of years back. Well, we want you to write to one of your friends in the FBI and tell them <laughs> about this film. Obviously, don't mention us. But <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And just see what happens, see what kind of response you can stir up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can totally see that's maybe in fact exactly what happened there. We'll we'll never know for sure, will we? <laughs> but um as we said before, I mean the film itself is is an utterly gorgeous production. If you can get hold of the, the Blu ray version, I'm not suggesting buy it, of course, but it's uh, av- <laughs> available by other sources, other means. Um then then do because it looks fantastic. Um but aside from its kind of historical significance and all of that I mean, the, the fundamental propaganda operation that goes on in this film, I would say, is is with the change to the ending, because it completely screws up Orwell's message in, in the original book. Because the original book, as I read it, and feel free to disagree with me here, but it's about, it's a parable, it's a metaphor about the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, and the resulting Soviet system that grew out of that. And so it shows these animals driving out the old system of the farmer, who represents the Tsar, and it has the animals run the farm themselves. And inevitably, the revolution becomes corrupted. The animals at the top, who are the pigs, of course, 
uh, Big Brother, <laughs> as, as they kept saying in all of the promotional stuff. Um, <laughs> very bad pun. Um, <laughs> anyway, so they're going on about how the humans are bad and the animals are good, but they're perfectly happy to trade with the humans to get what they want. And eventually this gets to the point where one of the animals is spying on the farmhouse where all the pigs live. And he sees that the pigs are sat around a dinner table, dressed in clothes, eating with cutlery, basically behaving like humans and sat side by side with the humans. And the book finishes with the animal. I think it's the donkey. Um, Benjamin, yeah. Yeah. He's looking from one to other, from pigs to animal, uh, pigs to humans and back again. And he's not able to tell the difference. And that's how Orwell finishes the book. And it's quite a downcast ending, but I would say a very realistic and very accurate mm. uh, uh, take on, on what really happened. Um, I would not necessarily accept everything that he thought about the Russian Revolution, but anyway, the end of the movie, very, very different. It sees, after this, uh, Benjamin goes back and he tells the other animals, and the animals march on the farmhouse, and there is the beginning of another fight, another war, another revolution, to overthrow the dictatorship of the pigs. So this is quite, quite different to what Orwell was saying. Um, I'd say and there's no humans. Oh, of course. No, you don't see the humans around the dinner table mm-hmm. at the end. He just sees the pigs and sees them looking like humans. Mm-hmm. So you don't get that sense of them, you know, playing both sides against the middle. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, what's your take on this ending? I'm pretty sure this is the CIA's influence on the film. It kind of has to oh, be. Yeah. <laughs> um, but among the various reasons that we've thought of for why this might be, what do you, I mean, what do you think? What do you think they were really trying to get across here? What, what was the propaganda purpose here? Oh yeah, I think that I think the overall purpose is to simply, whereas Orwell was was as you said talking about the Bolsheviks, but I think broadly speaking, of course, you know there are many um, there are different characters within this. You know, Napoleon is is definitely supposed to be Stalin. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Snowball is is Trotsky. Um, Squealer is uh, meant to be um, uh, Molotov, I believe, who is a chief propagandist for Stalin. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can also look at the book as it just simply being an anti-statist book. And I think that that is something, um, that is a constant in both animal farm and 1984 that, you know, the state is, uh, an evil entity or can become such an evil entity. Uh, and this devotion to it is so, um, evil. Uh, so that is something that certainly the CIA does not want to promote anywhere. <laughs> and I think, um, that r- what they're really saying is just that, um, you know, the Russians are evil. Communism is even more evil. And we need to, you know, overthrow it if it ever comes here. But again, more importantly, and why they probably chose Hallis and Bachelor was to export this movie to places like Russia, uh, to other other countries um, that might have a, a more um, positive view of communism uh, than say the West did at the time, and to really be like, look, look at these pigs. I mean, they're 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 evil. They're stupid. Um, and, and again, they also you know they they simplify so many of the characters in this. Um, and it's interesting that uh, it's Benjamin in the book who is much older. Uh, he's like one of the older animals, and um, Benjamin is the one that discovers the pigs and the humans interacting together, and he can't tell the difference between the two. Benjamin, in the book, is also uh, one of the few animals that can actually read, uh, unlike uh, many of the other ones. And uh, Benjamin is believed to have been Orwell. That is, you know, the the Orwell put himself into the novel a little bit with Benjamin. And I read somewhere um, that um, or- one of Orwell's friends uh, nicknamed him uh, George Donkey. Um, but <laughs> the movie, in the movie, uh, Benjamin is uh, never speaks. All he does is just like, bah, bah. He's just always screaming. Um, very stupid character. Uh, and again, uh, that's an interesting thing. And I can only imagine that Jarashman or one of his CIA handlers specifically told him to put that into the movie because they make the Benjamin character just sort of seem um, like, a you know, just one of the one of the proles, just sort of stupid, but kind of realizes that it's bad. And, and that's another interesting thing is that uh, none of the animals are, are quite smart, um, whereas in the in the book. There, there are characters like Benjamin. There's Muriel is another one. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they completely cut out uh, Moses, the raven, who's a very interesting character in the book um, and is nowhere in the movie whatsoever. So, um, yeah, I think that the to get back to the sort of propaganda purposes, I think it was to, again, take a, a complex story and simplify it to a very base sort of level where you come away thinking communism bad, uh, 
you know, I guess capitalism is good, but it doesn't even have to be that. It basically is just destroy communism. You know, no matter what comes out of that, it'll be better. Um, you know, and, and don't worry because uh, we'll, we'll come in to help you and, and figure out the best way to, to go about reshaping uh, society, you know, with all of our, our ex-Nazis and whatnot <laughs> that the CIA had tucked away, ready to go. So I think that's the, the overall propaganda purpose is to make it um, – to make a simple story because ultimately that is what the CIA was obsessed with um, was uh, defeating communism. Um Despite, as we'll see, I think with uh, the film version of 1984, they didn't have uh, all that much of a problem working with communists or, or suspected communists, at least. So, yeah, but I think that's the, the overall purpose. Um, and I'll just say I was really bummed that Benjamin wasn't uh, a bigger character because he is my favorite character in the in the book because um, cool. he's the only skeptical one <laughs> who thinks that this is all a bit insane and maybe we shouldn't listen to the pigs and maybe we should just sort of, you know, live our lives and whatnot. Um, so it's sort of, you know, that was one of my major criticisms and Moses too, because he's such an interesting character in the book and, and he represents um, the, the sort of the Russian Orthodox church, um, which of course Stalin brought back. So, uh, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> no, sure. I mean, I think that is broadly speaking what they, what they're doing here. I mean, for me, it's, if anything, it's, it's much simpler. Um, like you say, this isn't about saying communism, bad capitalism, good. If anything, it's about saying communism, bad revolution, good. Yes. It's mm. about promoting the, the cult of revolution. That we, is something, something else they did in the interview, one might argue. Mm. At the end of that film, there is basically a revolution and a civil war in North Korea. And this is treated as this really positive, you know, upbeat mm -hmm. ending. And just like in Animal Farm, the notion that, oh, we'll just have another revolution because the last one went so horribly wrong. <laughs> It, it's not exactly a moral that if if you were approaching this film intellectually that you would buy into. But like you say, it isn't really aimed at intellectuals. It's 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 aimed at um, people who would just think, as you say, oh, this this evil corrupt pig system has has got to go. And obviously, hopefully, they'll be smart enough to recognise it's a metaphor for communism. Um, and that's that's all they were really doing. And when you think it's the CIA, perhaps more than any other organisation in the world who are responsible for revolutions, for synthetic revolutions, for false flag state-sponsored revolutions, um, promoting mm. in one of their very earliest films, if not their earliest film that we know about, um, promoting this concept, pro promoting this cultural revolution is very interesting to me. Mm, yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. But um, no, I think that, that might actually really be what they're, what they're saying. Again, and I mean, just to uh, look at the context, I mean, this is in around the same time of the uh, um, overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran. Um, there's, there's a lot of, you know, quote, revolutions and things oh, are going on. Oh, in Guatemala. Guatemala, yeah. exactly, well, yeah. I mean, well, no, no, is, it's, uh, it's, it's all going mm -hmm. on at the exact same time as yeah. these movies being made. There's no sure. doubt about it. Sure, Ho Chi Minh uh, becoming a, a relevant figure. Um, yeah, so really interesting. Um, but we should move on to 1984. We're not we're not going yeah. to devote anywhere near as much time to talking about this film because it is a truly dreadful film. Yes. <laughs> um, so neither of us have anywhere near as much patience or enthusiasm for talking about about this. But we have mm -hmm. to address it because the CIA were also involved. This seems to be like their follow up project. It was only a year or two after um, Animal One year, Farm yeah. comes out that they that they roll out the the sequel, if you like, in 1984. Uh, but Pierce, I mean, why don't you tell us about the the background to this movie, the, the brief bit that we know about the CIA connection, but more, perhaps, mm -hmm. significantly, the, the two main creative talents involved. Sure. Um, so, uh, well, even before that, um, there's a woman, uh, Frances Saunders, who's written several books about this time period dealing with the CIA and, and culture, and, and she has said in one of her books, and you can find there's many articles where she talks about this, that the CIA directly gave money to the film. Um, so that, you know, just to just sort of add that. But more importantly, um, the movie is directed by Michael Anderson and also stars Michael Redgrave. And uh, these are both interesting choices. Um, uh, both of them participated in uh, like wartime propaganda films. Um, Redgrave was in this movie called The Big Blockade, which uh, supposedly actually had like had sponsorship from the Ministry of Economic Warfare, yeah. and it's one of those these weird uh, propaganda films that uh, use like documentary footage and actors, and it, it, you know it's a very weird mesh of that kind of reality and fiction. Um, and Michael Anderson actually served in the Royal uh, Signal Corps, so he was actually um, participated in, in fighting. Um, but after uh, after that, 
uh, and just a year before the movie 1984 comes out, 1955, um, they both work together in a, another wildly successful um, a propaganda film uh, called The Dam Busters, which was all about um, this huge operation that went on um, and actually got assistance from the RAF. They got to use all sorts of planes. They got to go to um, bases that the original Dam Busters uh, worked from. So that's a very, you know, intimate. And this, again, this, is a, this was a huge movie. This was a big deal. And then the two of them um, go and work on 1984. Now, Michael Redgrave is a really fascinating character. And uh, this is somebody that Tom and I are really going to start to explore more, not so much in this season um, of the podcast, but probably in the next one, because he's involved in a, a couple other interesting movies, particularly The Quiet American, uh, which is another big CIA production. Uh, and he is a, an interesting choice again because, of all people, George Orwell suspected him of being a communist. Uh, and certainly uh, Michael Redgrave's daughter, Vanessa Redgrave, is a, a bit of a commie. Um, and, yeah. and that uh, is a – it wasn't – you know, it wasn't uh, – I believe uh, M, there's a big MI5 file that I'm sure we can include in the show notes on Michael Redgrave and his uh, communist sympathies. And I think Orwell had a, a actual type, typed up list of various people that he's suspected of being communist. Some of them are more obvious than others, and he has, you know, more proof. For Redgrave, I believe he says something like, there's just a question mark next to his name, but he's pretty sure he is. All the same, uh, it was a well known that he had communist sympathies. So, again, it's very odd that the CIA that is helping to produce a movie um, that, again, 1984, very anti-communist, and Orwell was extremely uh, despised communism, that they would pick Michael Redgrave. Uh, and is even it's even odder uh, that they would uh, the CIA would pick him to be in a movie, The Quiet American, which is all about uh, defeating communism uh, <laughs> in, in Vietnam. But anyway... Uh, Redgrave is a, one of these characters that uh, I, you know the listener should really keep an eye out for, and just to keep in the back of your head because there's something larger. There's some larger thing going on. Um, Tom and I aren't quite sure where what that is or what it means, but uh, Redgrave is a really odd choice to pick um, for 1984. Uh, certainly George Orwell, if he was alive, would have protested this. I believe he <laughs> would not have been down with with having Redgrave. Um, in a movie version of his film. Um, but yeah, those are the sort of uh, broad based connections. So again, I mean, Michael Anderson, Michael Redgrave, uh, you're talking about people that are familiar with making propaganda films, just like Howlis and Bachelor. I believe that's why they were, they were picked. Uh, again, we've got this weird British connection. Um, and I believe 1984 was actually filmed in England and it was an English company, but was distributed by Columbia. So, uh, you know, I'm, and I'm sure there's lots of speculation maybe as to why this they did these um, these movies in England. I think the main one uh, that we were sort of talking about before is to just add a degree of separation between the CIA and these productions because the CIA was not uh, open about being involved in movies at this time. But so those are the the major CIA connections. And then again, um, the the movie is absolutely atrocious. Um, <laughs> apologies for the listeners if you go out and watch it. I mean, I, I would say watch it just so that, you know, it'll make this discussion better, but it is absolutely horrible. Um, and in fact, in the opening credits, it says freely adapted from the novel 1984. By George yeah, Trump. I love, I love so, that page. Yeah, I've never heard of freely adapted before. <laughs> uh, and a lot of the, um, the changes in the movie are, there are little changes, but they're quite deliberate and, uh, this sort of leads me to believe uh, again that there had to be involvement from some sort of agency outside because the some of the changes are so odd that it just has to be um, some sort of CIA operation going on there. But I don't know. I'll, I'll give it back to you, Tom, if you have anything else to add on that. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll uh, just return to that in a moment. There was a couple of things I did want to highlight um, that, as, as best we know, the the mechanism by which this film was. Uh, I don't know, funded and to some extent produced uh, by the CIA was the, I think it was called the Committee for Cultural Freedom, mm. which is, of course, itself a very Orwellian name, um, <laughs> given that this whole thing was being supervised and overseen by the CIA itself. So why would the CIA be interested in cultural freedom? Well, obviously, they wouldn't. <laughs> but also something I, I, I just wanted to bring up, well, a couple of things. Uh, Michael Anderson, the director of uh, 1984, 
Um, he only worked on a couple of movies as an actor, but one of them was oh, yes. uh, Noel Coward's 1942 mm. movie, In Which We Serve, which was a wartime propaganda movie produced with the British Ministry of Information, who is, of course, the basis for uh, the mm. department of the same name in 1984. So <laughs> there's yeah. a lot, you know, Michael mm. Anderson very much knew the world that George Orwell was writing about. He must, you know, he, he was intimately involved in it. That's how he became you know, a film actor and a film director. And to a lesser extent, Michael Redgrave, but still to a significant extent. But you look at all of these men, they all made their first government-assisted films in 1942. And that's not a coincidence as such, because obviously there was a war on. That's why they were doing it then. But it struck me as interesting that, you know, all of them, Louis de Rochemont, uh, Michael Anderson, Michael Redgrave, all made their first government-assisted movies in the same year. So it's like I say, not coincidental, but you can see a kind of, um, if you like, a, a narrative growing mm. here that, you know, the following decade, they then graduated on to making CIA propaganda movies. And like you say, not at all surprising that these were the sorts of men they would pick to get involved, except with Redgrave, because as you say, Orwell, even Orwell himself flagged Redgrave as a, as a probable <laughs> communist or as at least a crypto communist or something. Um, so <laughs> maybe there again, that was a, another kind of fuck you to George Orwell. Um, maybe, oh yeah, I think so. You know, maybe that's one of the reasons they picked him. I'm not sure, but I mean, my take on on the really depressing nature of this film and the really <laughs> kind of drab, unpleasant. I mean, it's not a good film to watch. It it, it is it is as bad as Animal Farm is good, really. <laughs> um, I think they were trying to possibly they were trying to recreate the sort of depressing world that Orwell describes in 1984, but in the book because that's kind of counterbalanced with the. Uh, mental and emotional struggle of the protagonist you don't really get that in cinema because you don't see inside people's heads so much so maybe maybe just they were trying to recreate the same kind of tone but failed because they were just trying to translate a book into cinema and it didn't work very well that would be my trying to give them an excuse interpretation Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, or it's just that the CIA were trying to make this story as awful and horrible as possible so that it has a, a lasting effect on people, that it just creates this vague impression of the, the, the horrible tedium of life in the Soviet state, and that that's all they were really trying to do with it, that they didn't really mm-hmm. care about the rest of the story and the rest of its power. But, I mean, just before we conclude and wrap up here, what do you, what do you make of this 1984 and why, why they made it the way they did? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was just sort of thinking as you were talking there, I mean, perhaps they also wanted to make it as boring and unpleasant uh to dissuade people from actually reading the novel um, oh yeah Possibly. you know many many people uh you know watch movies and oh oh this is based on a book i'm gonna go read it uh, i can't imagine anyone wanting to read this book if you had just seen the film it is so absolutely horrible and um <laughs> edmund o'brien who plays winston in the movie is just i mean he's barely even phoning it in it, it almost seems like he knows that he's just making some some CIA propaganda film and he just doesn't really care. Um, and then, as I said before, some of the weird changes, the movie is ultra-futuristic versus this sort of bombed-out England. Um, and then these are just a couple weird ones that just sort of popped into my mind. Um, uh, instead of vaporizing, uh, which is what they use when, they, when someone is killed or taken out, they use liquidated. And instead of the memory hole, it's called the vaporizer. And I, I don't know why, but for some reason, that just sort of popped into my mind as, as a weird thing. But yeah, I think the movie is just, uh, they just kind of wanted to get it out there. I think, uh, you know, it worked as a, a, as you said, as a sort of follow-up. Uh, and just, yeah, to kind of, again, just reinforce this idea that uh, that all Orwell was talking about was that the Soviet Union was horrible and you would never want to live there. So oppose communism and the Soviets at all costs, no matter what. Uh, it doesn't really matter. And that they, they kind of just spent, I think, less time making this because they they, they just didn't care as much. And I think that, uh, again, Animal Farm works a little bit better uh, visually, whereas most of 1984 is really in, internal. You know, you're you're just sort of you're playing it out through Winston. Mm. Um, and that's why I think the, the book is, I mean, just fabulous in that sense. Um, and, uh, you know, it, when you read it, I mean, it, you're, you're true. I mean, you physically are affected, uh, by the writing, uh, and you can't really do that in film. Um, the, the, there is a, another version of this with, um, uh, what's his name? 
John Hurt. Who's now escaping me. Yes, John Hurt, who is a, a very uh, interesting uh, character to or actor to to pick, and that that's actually not that bad. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, this movie is just horrible. And just one last thing, um, that's another one of these. The CIA must just be wetting themselves with joy when they see this. But the um, many many people might be familiar with the um, the Big Brother is watching you. The uh, the image. Uh, and that's you know it's like a meme that gets repeated on the internet. People use it as their avatar, and you'll know what I'm talking about if you just type it in. It's a drawing that is from the CIA funded version of 1984 from the 50s. So um, again, one of these you know that is the the kind of power um, that we're talking about with the CIA in terms of culture creation. That a an image like that can be used in the alternative media and they're, Oh yeah, we're so awake. Look, yeah. Big brother is watching you. You know, yeah, that's my avatar on Twitter. And that was created exclusively for a CIA, you know, production. Um, and again, that's, that is sort of that, um, occult power there that this image, uh, that they can sort of put out there that's hidden. You know, no one knew that the CIA was involved in this. And then that image is then used by other people. Um, and I think that that is a way that they, they do sort of, um, I don't know, consume power from people, but uh, I'm kind of rambling and we've probably been talking for too long on both of these. So, <laughs> No, 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 it's fine. I mean, it, I, I think you're absolutely right to highlight that, that that has now become a sort of, like you say, an avatar, an image of rebellion or an image of, of standing up against the system. When, of course, it's from a movie which is absolutely the system. It, it <laughs> represents the system that supposedly all these people are trying to fight against. And it just shows you, I suppose, not just how powerful the CIA's culture creation ability is, but also how powerful ignorance is. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I mean, yeah, let's wrap this up. There was, there's a couple of, of conclusions I want to kind of, uh, you know, takeaways that I want people to, to have from this episode. So I'll just run through those before offering, offering it back to you to offer your take. But in both cases, as we've been discussing, the films are not honest renderings of George Orwell's works. They are significant subversions of them by the very kind of institution that Orwell was so opposed to. And that isn't just irony. That isn't just doublethink. I think that's exactly the heart of this this operation, as far as the CIA were concerned, was to subvert Orwell. Um, Orwell, of course, was a British writer. Alison Batchelor, British animation company. Redgrave and Anderson, also British. So in both cases, in both these movies, it was largely British talent that was used to produce the CIA propaganda. And... Like you say, this was to a certain extent about distancing themselves, giving themselves plausible deniability. But I think there is also a crossover here that we'll be discussing more, hopefully, in the second season of this series, because it is quite prominent, this crossover between CIA propaganda and British filmmaking talent. What I will say is that it wasn't just the Americans, of course, that were at it. It wasn't just the CIA. The BBC also produced a version of 1984 that was broadcast at pretty much the exact same time that Animal mm -hmm. Farm came out. So uh, there was also a British intelligence operation to translate copies of Orwell's books into Chinese as part of some anti-Maoist operation, very, very similar to what the CIA were doing at the same time. So while some of the British people involved in these films probably didn't know what was going on, I get the impression that British intelligence knew what was going on and either mm. approved or just didn't do anything to oppose it. Um, and just finally, to re-emphasize once again, the purpose of these films is not about the CIA's public image. At that time, they basically had no public image. And as we've been talking about, and in fact, as someone said on the making of documentary on the DVD, one of the main points of this seems to be a kind of put down of George Orwell, an attempt to try and either just vandalize and ruin the impact of these, these really great novels, truly great works of fiction, or like you say, to latch onto it and subvert it for their own ends. Um, but Pierce, I mean, is there anything you'd like to add to that and whether there is or isn't? Uh, please do tell people about what to expect in the next episode that we've got coming up. Sure. Well, yeah, just to just to kind of sum up on on Orwell and this. Um, yeah, like, you know, we said this is as if there's a distinct British uh, element to all of this. Um, and I think that uh, obviously MI6 had to somebody <laughs> knew what was going on yeah. with all of these things. Um, but yeah, again, I think this is uh, an interesting case study to start this whole series because it does show that it's not just about um creating positive images of Hollywood. Sometimes it is about uh, taking down someone's image, in this case Orwell, mm -hmm. um, subverting the power 
uh, that that someone can possess for your own means. Uh, that's something else that we'll see um, in some of these movies, and also within some of the themes of some of the of the movies that we're going to be discussing later. Um, but yeah, I think it's just also important <clears throat> uh, to look that uh, this was how, in many ways, the CIA got started. You know, it wasn't it wasn't that they were going to invade Hollywood all at once. And and as we're going to explore, particularly in this season, that is what is going on right now. But you know, it starts in, in little tiny, you know, incrementally. This doesn't happen overnight. And instead, they decided to pick two very powerful novels and to see what they could do with them. Um, so that's a that's something to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, and as we move into these next films, um, you know, we're going to see how that has evolved somewhat. Um, what to expect from the 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 next episode is uh, quite a bit. We're going to we're going to be talking with our good friend Guillermo Jimenez from TracesOfReality.com. dot com. Um, and uh, in, the, in our second episode, we're going to really be exploring uh, this character that Tom mentioned at the top of this episode, Chase Brandon. Uh, who is sort of the guy in in Hollywood uh, in terms of CIA um, sponsorship, and we're gonna be we're gonna be kind of tracing uh, Chase Brandon's uh, sort of prominence throughout Hollywood um, with a man Robert De Niro who has played Chase Brandon in multiple films. So I think that's gonna be really interesting. And uh, what people should really expect in the second episode is a more sort of um, uh, in your face approach to this, we're going to see, uh, we're going to really kind of dive into the connections, uh, and, and show you that it isn't just, uh, again, it's not just about images. It's, it's also about culture creation. It's about implanting weird things. And we're also going to be looking at a couple films, uh, that De Niro was in that you would have never pegged as CIA productions, but were actually, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll be exploring, uh, why, um, and again, with De Niro, we're talking about a guy whose uh, much of his career is predicated on his cooperation with the CIA. And this is another theme that we're going to see with several of the other movies that we're dealing with this season, uh, that there are is definitely a subgroup within Hollywood that is groomed and picked and their careers are very much the result of their cooperation with the CIA. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's uh, that's what the listeners should expect. And I, I hope they really enjoyed uh, this first episode. And I know that uh, I am just so excited to, to you know, kickstart the season. So thank you again, Tom. Well, and, and thank you, Pierce, because I know you've devoted and committed quite a lot of time to doing this series with me. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the rest of this season. Mm-hmm. I know this first one may have been a little longer than... Uh, people might have liked but we have had to kind of out lay out quite a lot of different stuff that will pay off later trust me if you stay with this series uh, you will see why we (laughs) kind of devoted so much to this first one but yeah thank you pierce and to the audience i just want to say thank you for listening and there is a lot more coming so please do stay with us or come back soon for another episode of the cia and hollywood